Very good morning to you and thanks for joining us on the run up. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. And I am Uche Chuku Onodu. Well, today is another very wonderful day and it's very close to weekend and people are already preparing to say thank God it's Friday. Yeah. Well, this is Thursday. <laughs> still, a lot of things can still happen. And uh, we're throwing back we today. It's mm. throwing back Thursday. So I, I hope you're going to be turning up somewhere. Today? No, tomorrow. Uh, until so tomorrow. I plans. Mm, I'll but, carry your bag. But today <laughs> we're remembering something very important yeah. that happened two years ago. Yeah. One year after the National Economic Council, chaired by Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo, directed states to pay compensation to the victims of police brutality in the country. Indications show that many states have yet to comply with the directive. Only Lagos, Oshun, Ekiti and the Federal Capital Territory are said to have complied with the NEC resolution. This is happening as activists say they would hold rallies to commemorate the second anniversary of the NSAS protest at the Lekki toll gate and other parts of the country today, which police has warned against. However, two years after the deadly protest, many states had yet to implement the, plans, the panel's recommendations, rather, including compensation for victims of the violence. In October 2021, the NEC after a meeting directed the state governments to pay compensation to the victims of police brutality across the country. Following this, the Lagos state government paid 420 million naira, or Shun state presented the sum of 53.2 million naira to 13 victims in May. The Abuja panel paid 439 million naira and the Akiti state government disbursed 21.25 million naira. Or your state government said it had paid victims of police brutality who were awarded compensation by NSAS panel. We are yet to know the figure of that payment. Akwai Bom and Benwe State say it was not the responsibility of the state government but that of the federal government to compensate the victims. They argued that the state's responsibility was to conduct the hearings and send the reports to the federal government, adding that the protests were as a result of atrocities committed by the Nigerian police. Uh, recall that the NSAS uh, processions began as a peaceful protest by youths against the excesses and brutality of the disbanded police anti-robbery squad. But uh, it took a violent turn after it was hijacked by thugs who attacked the protesters and police stations and also looted businesses on October 20th. Uh, 2020. About 51 civilians, 11 police officers, and seven soldiers reportedly died in the unrest, while scores of protesters were detained. Consequently, the presidency and state governments set up judicial panels of inquiry to investigate cases of police brutality and extrajudicial killings, among others. Following the order, 28 states and the Federal Capital Territory set up panels while Yobe, Borono, Jigawa, Kano, Kebi, Sokoto and Zamfara failed to do so. Over 2,500 petitions were submitted to the panels across the nation. However, uh, two years after the deadly protests, many states are yet to implement the panel's recommendations, including compensation for victims of the violence. In October 2021, the NEC, after a meeting, had suggested that uh, all the recommendations of the panels be uh, looked into. They directed the state governments to pay compensation to the victims of police brutality across the country. Following this, the Lagos state government paid 420 million naira, or Shul state presented the sum of 53.2 million naira uh, to 13 victims in May. The Abuja panel paid 439 million naira, and the Kiti state government disbursed. 21.25 million naira. Oyo state government said it had paid victims of police brutality who were awarded compensation by NSAS panel. We still do not have the figure that they paid out. Akwaibom and Benue states said it was not the responsibility of the state governments but that of the federal government to compensate the victims. They argued that the state's responsibility was to conduct the hearings and send the reports to the federal government, adding that the protests were as a result of atrocities committed by the Nigerian police. 
Anambra State says it is still studying the report of the NSAS panel submitted in March 15, 2022, during the last administration in the state. And uh, meanwhile, a global human rights uh, organization, Amnesty International, has said 40 Nigerians who participated in the NSAS protest on October 20, 2020, are still languishing in prison custody two years after the nationwide demonstrations in which several lives were lost and properties damaged. The group released the names of the detainees on Wednesday in commemoration of the second anniversary of the rallies, disclosing that the protesters who being held at Agodi Correctional Center or your state and Kirikiri Medium Security Prison in Lagos without trial. Uh, AIS Country Director Osai Ojio uh, lamented that the proceedings of the panels were characterized by intimidation of witnesses by police, lawyers and prolonged adjournment among others, she regretted that over 40 protesters were still being detained illegally two years after the NSAS protest, demanding for immediate release despite re reportedly suffering from ill health. Today, we remember all Nigerians who have lost their lives at the hands of uniformed men and uniformed men who also have lost their lives needlessly in the line of duty. And we mourn whoever died unjustly or did not deserve to die, no matter at whose hands uh, they lost their lives. Now we are going to move straight to our first guest for today. And the first guest is a seasoned journalist. He was one of the most detailed in the coverage of the NSAS. It's our pleasure to welcome this morning, Nicholas Ibekwe. And we are starting off with our first guest this morning on the run-up. He's a journalist and he's one of the people who covered the NSAS protests. He was very detailed in his report. Uh, Mr. Nicholas Ibekwe, good morning and thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning, Liza, with me on your program. All right, uh, let's kick off this way. How would you rate the response of the government two years after the NSAS protest happened? Well, I think it's not encouraging. Um, we have seen some states. First, we need to commend those states that have uh, gone ahead to pay compensation. I mean, um, lives have been lost, and I don't think... Um, monetary, there's a, there's a monetary value to any life that has been lost. But at least the money that was paid will provide some kind of um, circle and some kind of respite for farms. some of these people who were killed by the police, uh, by the South, where, where the family, were breadwinners of the families and all of that. So this will go a long way. It will go, into, uh, go a long way in uh, trying to help the family get their lives together. Um, having said that, I think, I think I should also add that um, I am shocked that two years um, afterwards, some states are still dilly-dallying and um, they've not done what they should do. I mean, some have not even started the um, panel in the first place. So, and some are still arguing, like a quiet bomb and, and Bill May are still arguing who is to pay the money um, and who is not to pay it. But anyway, which, whichever way it is, I think the response has is less than encouraging. I think by now, I was hoping that um, all compensation would have been paid. But apart from that, apart from that, maybe you get to that. The one thing that worries me more than the payment of compensation is that we tend to believe that once compensation has been paid, then um, that exonerates anybody or anybody who has been um, who has been accused or who has been indicted as um, uh, carrying a extrajudicial killing or torture or all of that. Funny enough, the policemen who carried out these extrajudicial actions have not been punished. So, in trying to correct the ease of SARS and other extrajudicial actions by the police, the payment of, of, of compensation alone doesn't cut it. We have to go beyond paying compensation. We have to make sure that those people who were invited as having killed people or having tortured people or having extorted people face the full lot of the country with laws. We are not a lawless country. 
there are laws and punishments for people who and no matter who they are uh, who commit such atrocity. But what we have seen in the entrance probe and the entrance panel is just that it's more like a talk show where people are giving money. And the panel has not taken the step um, to punish the police. And that's what the police has done. The police has basically shielded those who have committed the atrocity. But as long as this is not done, because some of these people are still in the police, they are still going about with guns, they are still extreme people. And um, if we don't move them out of the police and we don't have them face the full of the law, then one day we'll be back to where we have um, to where we started, which will be disheartening if you ask me. Okay, uh, well, some people will just be thinking, uh, because a lot of people have come out to say this answers the killings and all that are not true. We remember just recently uh, an ally of the presidential candidate for the APC said that if they want to say people were killed uh, at Lekki Tollgate, for instance, that they should provide the bodies. And statements like that have come up where people are denying the fact that people actually died on that day. But you covered the, um, I will not want to call it the event, but you covered the protest very, very, in a very detailed way. Can you give us some of these insights that gives you the conviction that these people deserve to be given the kind of compensation we are talking about? What else did you see that they are not telling us? Uh, I'm not sure a whole lot. People were actually killed. People were shot. People were killed. And you know, we should also get this. The police did a mock after after the after the soldiers came in to shoot at the, at the crowd and disperse the crowd. The police came in as at around 2 a.m., between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. in the morning, and did because some protesters didn't leave, some protesters um, um, stood back and continued to protest into the night. And the police came up and did more pop. A lot of people were shot and killed. I have pictures, I have videos. I spoke to people who um, 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 secure, who um, um, were shot in the arm, another part of the body. Uh, that was a shanty behind the uh, uh, the toll gate. It's, it's because after my story was published, the Lagos government had gone in and demolished that shanty, and all this is part of their part of their uh, method to cover up what was going to happen on 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 the evening. So I think we're sure. I saw a lot of people. I and I, it is also disingenuous for the government to say that oh, let's provide the police. But what happened was that the police or the military. Um, took the body away after shooting the body. The body was taken away. And again, I saw some like a guy called Sunday Michael. He is from Akwa Ibom. I spoke to his brother. As we speak to you today, we saw his picture when he was shot. We saw his video when he was shot. His brother um, identified him when he was shot at the toll gate. His body has not been seen till as we speak to you today. He has not returned when he was shot. I, I mean, it was it was all over. It was, it was my story. He was shot. I spoke to, to to this person. His body has not been seen. So what happened to the body of Sunday Michael? Who took the body of Sunday? If if if, if, the, if they are saying that body was shot, what happened to Sunday Michael, for instance? And the, and when they keep saying, "Oh, where are their relatives?" Yeah, Sunday Michael's brother came out to identify him. The one who was shot. He has not seen his body of his. Body. I spoke to um, an artist, you know, in the next area, a lot of development going on there. I spoke to an artist who was working on a, on a property, and he said, and some of these artists come all the way from, from far and wide, some of them come from Benin Republic, some of them come from all the way from Madagri, and they will just come to Lekki and they get a job and they start working, you know. So, so I spoke to an artist who said, Four of them went out on the evening. Four of them went out on the evening of the shooting to protest. That they didn't know these people, they didn't know their relatives, but all they knew is that they met them at the site and they were walking because they were sleeping at, at the site. But in most cases, the artisans, the bricklayers, the vendors, and all of that, they sleep at the site until the building is complete. I mean, if you go to one of these, um, Estates that are being built, you see that most of before the the real owner buys them or most of them, most of them 
people live in areas who so actually live there. So there were four of them who went out of the evening, and only two of them returned. All of them, he has no way of contact with those people. He never came back to sites, he never returned, he never saw them. And they were at, they were at the, at, at, at the um, uh, toll gate together. They have, they have put another thing that they leave behind. What until the on This is about three weeks after. So what to do is they find the thing what a body. I saw I saw um shells of women like the even the army, the military first was changing the story. The first said, oh we didn't shoot at any or they didn't change it all, we use rubber bullets, you know. So they, as, as far as it just keep coming up, so that at any point in time, so that they say it was not true, they keep moving, they, they, keep, they keep changing their story. Yeah. In their story like that, that is, you know, somebody is lying, or somebody is covered up something. So all these are facts. I mean, the government can go on to continue to um, deny that people were not killed and being flaky, uh, and before DJ, DJ, the um, on the night, how did and Adam laugh? Why you were telling me watching? Who were shocked? Your audio about? is quite bad, uh, but I think we got <coughs> the points uh, that you're trying to make. Thank you so much, Mr. Nicholas Ibekwe for joining the program this morning, uh, for answering our questions as well. It was a pleasure speaking to you this morning. Thank you so much for coming on the run up. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, one question uh, remains unanswered. A lot of questions actually yeah. remain unanswered. I mean, when we talk about the NSAS protest and all the, uh, you know, everything that led to the point where youths began, began to gather in their numbers in different states of the mm -hmm. Federation, uh, a few questions remain unanswered. One of which is a question you just asked, Mr. Ibekwe, uh, did people really die? A lot of people have the answers uh, yeah. you know, to themselves. Yeah. And one other question that remains unanswered is, who gave the order? There was a shooting. Who mm -hmm. gave the order? That question, I hope one day we get an answer. Yeah, well, um, whether we like it or not, there are victims. And states have begun to pay some compensation, which means it's a partial admittance that mm. things like that happen. Maybe in Lagos, uh, they keep saying that uh, nobody gave the order, which is not possible, and that people didn't die. But people have been given compensations. And if people were wounded to the extent that they will pay 400 and something million naira yes. to them, I'm sure some other people could have died. We don't have the <laughs> figure because officially we've not been told that this is what happened. Yes. But on the w one side, the people are saying it happened. The government is saying it didn't happen. We don't know who to believe. How we just, long are we going to We keep, just hope that you know. the families of the people who, whether real or imagined, lost people on that day will have comfort, will find comfort, and the souls of those people who... Uh, we lost. Mm -hmm. We'll find peace. Amen. And we will take a quick break right now. When we return, the run up will continue. And in, in the break, we are going to celebrate one of our very own. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Stay with us. We're glad to know you're still there and watching us. And uh, we also wanted to use this time to celebrate one of our own. We'll call her a hero. We'll call her a meta. We'll call her one of the greatest patriots to ever come from Nigeria, uh, Dr. Stella Adadevo, who paid the supreme price as well. Today we're talking about people who paid the supreme prize trying to make nigeria better she also paid a price uh, by making sure that ebola does not go beyond the walls of the um, hospital where the first case the index case uh, was brought to we so we remember dr adadevo today and pray that she will rest in peace amen We've now been joined by Professor Chris Nwokobia, one-time presidential candidate and convener of Country Fest. Good morning and welcome to the program, Prof. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be on with you. Okay, let's start off by saying this is exactly 127 days to election and there are 84,000 uh, for 84, more than 84,000 registered voters. Oh, 84 million rather, million, yeah. And then we have 176,846 uh, polling units, 18 political parties, 
The question is, are we ready for 2023? I think that um, if we follow what INEC has been telling us, um, they appear um, getting ready for it. They appear like uh, very set and committed to ensuring that we have free, fair, and credible elections. Um, Mahmoud uh, Yakub has addressed a few press conference uh, conferences a lot earlier than one would have expected. The other day it was about the use of the beavers, and he's insisting that uh, he would use electronic uh, voting protocol rather than the hoopla by certain elements who do not want uh, electronic transmission of results. So he appears ready for free, fair, and credible polls. And then when our dear president was at the UNGA uh, in the United States of America, he did say that if there is anything he would do is to ensure that he, uh, under him, conducts a free, fair, and credible election as he exits power. But let me correct something. Yamgul, I think we have about 93 million registered voters, according to INAC. You know, it was supposed to be about 95. And then if you remove the 2 point something million that they said, uh, double registrations, it would be about 93 million registered voters. And the greater percentage of them are young people. Uh, uh, today, the country is, you know, in one place. Uh, to mark the second anniversary of the NSAS protest. How would the memories of that day, real or imagined, uh, how do you think it would affect the forthcoming elections? Like you could read where I was coming from, I was, I was trying to preempt you, and that's because uh, today it's... Um, if you like, melancholic for anybody who truly has a soul, you know. Uh, today, uh, two years ago, Nigerian young people who stepped out to demand for um, SARS to be reformed, the policing protocol to be reviewed, and the human dignity, the dignity of the human persona in this country to be valued, were met with the most draconic state reaction to an otherwise peaceful protest. And as you and I talk, we're aware that across our country, young people have stepped out and stepped up the ante. Young people are asking for a new deal, a new day, a new tendency in governance, and a much more responsible and responsive watch. And so, uh, as 2023 stares us in the face, you can tell that the political firmament is far more tense than ever, because the young people are asking for a new dispensation in leadership. And I have couched what is about to happen, what is about to come, as a peaceful, balanced-based people's revolution. I think that the young people, like uh, what obtained or happened a few days ago in Lesotho, like what happened in Zambia, and like what happened in Kenya, the young people in Africa are rising up and they're asking for responsible and responsive leadership. And so 2023 won't be different in this climb. The young people will take back their country through the ballot. Okay, what? Well, how, how would you rate the response of government and people to this day in our nation's history? If we had a responsible and responsive leadership, uh, if I were President Yangul, I will address the nation. I will talk to young people. I will tell them that what they went through two years ago were perhaps the fault of overzealous security agents, agents and agencies. I will talk to them, I will pacify them, I will immortalize this day as a day of youth resistance against uh, ill rule. I will celebrate them, and that would otherwise have been the way to go. But unfortunately, um, we live in a country where leadership sees every coloration of protestation as inimical where leadership sees questions and demands for justice and for review 
of our protocols as a nation, as opposition, where leadership is jittery at the commitment of young people for a new deal and a new day. But I want to say that whether they recognize this day or not, across the country, young people are celebrating their days. If you notice across my social media handles, uh, I have celebrated the young people because let me say this, Yamgo. Two years ago, Nigerian young people taught the world an example in peaceful protestation. For about 10 days, they were at Lekki, in Ikeja, across the old toll gate. They were there peacefully until certain draconic agents of state provoked conflict, crisis, and violence. We taught the world. Remember, it was just a few months or so after the George Floyd murder and the protestations across America. And most of those cities about in, across America, in about 130 cities, in well over 70 cities in America, there was violence. But across Nigeria, in Abuja, in Enugu, across this country, young people taught the world an example in peaceful protestation. And instead of saluting them, instead of celebrating them, uh, overzealous state agents, those who do not value civil democracy, those who do not appreciate the right of the people to protest, provoked violence. And according to the reports of the Lagos State uh, uh, Inquisition, inquiry into the, about 45 people were killed, about 99 bodies were found after that, you know, but as I, as I talk to you, I talk to you with tears in my eyes, with a heavy heart. But, you know, interestingly, my solace is in the fact that the young people haven't given up. The young people haven't been cowed. The young people are resolved and resolute, and they want to take back their country. And indeed, I see a ballot-based people's revolution that will change the order for, for the better. Okay, um, well, we do hope that um, the revolution comes and it still comes as peacefully as we would like it to be. But um, uh, just quickly, just quickly now, uh, your projection for 2023, do you think there's going to be a, a third force? Because even as we talk about youths trying to take back their country, people still feel that uh, the status quo will be maintained. You know, the, the political elites that have ruled this country for uh, from time immemorial, will still continue and there is not going to be a credible third force. Do you believe in a third force or is business as usual? Briefly now, please. Let me say clearly, Yamgul, in Lesotho, a party was formed in March and they won the general polls a few days ago. In Zambia, a third force emerged and they said the candidate leading the opposition and the contestation was a social media president. He won the election. In Kenya, against the five entrenched families, the Kenyatta family, the Arakmoy family, the Odinga family, Roto came from nowhere against the entrenched forces, the presidency, and won the polls. There's a wind blowing across our nation and indeed our continent. It is called zeitgeist, the spirit of the time. I want to tell you that I do not see a third force. I see one force. And that force, permit me to say clearly before Nigerians who are listening to us, is the obedient movement. The two major entrenched forces will not win the 2023 polls. You can take that to the bank. The Nigerian young people will take back their country through the candidacy of Peter Gregory O.B. of the Labour Party. It's one force, the people's force. Okay, well, thank you so much. I like the optimism and Nigerians uh, gladly uh, catching the bug, as it were. And 2023 hopefully will be greater than all others, except for the option A4 that, brought, uh, uh, that was brought in 1993. Thank you so much, Professor, for being a part of our program today. God bless you. God bless Nigeria. Amen. All right, and the run-up would continue after this quick break. Stay with us. Do not go anywhere.
you welcome back we're still here and we're talking a lot of things and SARS is there we're remembering our heroes past and present and wishing that uh, God will take the souls of those who uh, we have lost in the course of uh, our struggle to make Nigeria better mm -hmm. we're being joined now by the um, Immediate, publicity, immediate past publicity secretary of the People's Democratic Party and uh, uh, spokesman of the presidential campaign for PDP, uh, Mr. Kola Ologbondinyan. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Good morning, my Thank you very much. Good morning, my dear. Okay. Well, today we remember an SARS protest, uh, which degenerated into something that was not the um, intention. And this brings to question our security uh, situation in Nigeria. And we're wondering what your party has in stock for Nigerians, uh, security-wise, if they are going to be elected in 2023. Thank you very much. When um, Atiku Abubakar is elected president and sworn in on May 29th, 2023 by the grace of god we have the confidence that we are going to remodel the nigerian police we have the confidence that we are going to 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 retrain the nigerian police we have the confidence that article worker as he has promised on the issue of devolution of power will allow for state community local government policing system in a manner that will depend on intelligence gathering. And we believe that unlike the police system that was handed over from the colonial days, that the new exigencies will form the training background for incoming officers and men of the armed forces. Uh, can your presidential candidate be trusted? We, we say this because uh, he could not or he has been perceived not to have been able to, uh, you know, respond to uh, a lot of conversations that has come out uh, due to the tweets that he, he made when Deborah was murdered in the north by Islamic extremists. He, he posted a tweet but later deleted it because a lot of young persons came at him for that tweet. And then recently, he has been in the news uh, for a statement that he made during the meeting uh, with the Northerners. What do you have to say about that? Let, let, let me make something abundantly clear. That among the arrays of Nigerians aspiring to preside over our nation post-May 29, 2023, that Atiku Abubakar, the Wazir Adamawa, the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, stands out as that candidate that's a unifier. He stands out as that candidate that believes in the diversity of our nation and who also have a strong understanding of the nuances of our nation and who has also committed himself to managing these diversities. And what you can find around him, since he has been in the public arena, is that Atiku Abaka is that Nigerian that you cannot hold down to his side. You cannot say that he's divisive at all. Forget what politics is bringing today. Look at where the man is coming from. Check his background, who he is, who are his friends, where are his investments. I think this should showcase the kind of a person that Atiku Abubakar is. Now, for those who are tying themselves to, oh, he made a statement in Kaduna. What statement did he make in Kaduna? Before going to Kaduna, Atiku Abubakar started his campaign from, um, he, started, he, started, he started his campaign first by going to the Northwest in the state of Kano. From there, he proceeded to the Southwest in the state of Oyo. From there, he proceeded to the, to the zone of Northeast in the state of Bochi. From there, he proceeded to south south, sorry, to southeast in the state of Enugu. Before he proceeded to the state, or to the zone of south south in, in the state of uh, Akwaibom. Having laid this background, having laid this foundation, everywhere Atiku went to, he told the people, I'm a part of you, vote for me. He also went to Kaduna on the second, as we begin to go to the, on the second round of the campaign, he was in Kaduna, and he met with stakeholders from the north. And the question came up because it is important to go back to what led to that comment. 
there was a question that he was asked to give, to advance reason why the North will support him. And he said, I am a part of you. You don't need going outside of me to look for a candidate. This is a paraphrase of what Atiku said. But as expected, those who are interested in dragging him to their level as regional by gods now went and ran and said that, oh, he said they should not vote for Yoruba. He said they should not vote for Igbo. That is around nonsense, as far as I am concerned, and by the basic understanding of the situation that I have. Are you expecting the man to go to the north or to the west and say, vote for other candidates, don't vote for me? And the man said, I am a pan-Nigerian who has built bridges across this federation. And that is clear and manifestly so. Because when you look at the friends of Atiku Abubakar, they are from the east, they are from the west, they are from the south, and they are from the north. When you look at his interests, the bridges that he has built in the area of investment, he's not particular about any section. When you look about his, look towards his lifestyle, Atiku Abubakar cuts across. He's a nationalist who has been voted and elected as the vice president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He does not compare to anybody, any of the people who are aspiring to be president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And Atiku Abubakar has the experience which towers above any other aspirant for the office of the vice president. Okay, Mr. Uh, sir, we, we know his itinerary, how he has walked from place to place campaigning. Uh, but like my lecturer used to say, meanings are in people and not in words. And Nigerians may have chosen to interpret it the way they heard it and thought it should be. Because we watched the video and a lot, not many people will say that the video was something that was saying otherwise. But since you say there's a question, I expect that the, the PDP and the handlers of your principal might just do something and bring the full video to public glare so that we know the question that led to that and what, what went on after that. Let's know and damage, uh, control the damage together. But there is this other issue which my colleague raised that before now, there was the case of Deborah. Someone tweeted, and we know that if you have someone who is handling your social media, you should have someone that you trust, that knows your mind, whether you're there or not, can do one or two things. Someone tweeted that Atiku condemned the death of Deborah. Atiku came and pulled down that tweet and said that that was not him because the, it didn't end with AA. It was not him that said it, and we didn't have an alternative. So people are beginning to wonder, when it comes to security, will he be sectional? When it comes to security, is he strong enough to take decisions? And even the problems rocking the PDP right now, a lot of people feel he should have taken a stand. But now we see governors from PDP endorsing other governors from a very critical state like Lagos, for instance, and we have not seen something positive from Atiku. Is that a leader we should trust? Thank you very much. Atiku Abubakar remains the leader that Nigerians have absolute trust in. And I can say this on the basis of what I know of Atiku Abubakar. And this has nothing to do with politics. In 1999, when he came into office, as the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, along with President Olusegun Obasanjo. Atiku Abaka, as a manner, as a way of controlling the state of security as a then, encouraged his principal to recruit policemen. And no fewer than 10 policemen were recruited in that administration to manage the situation then. And I want us to be mindful of the fact that Atiku Abubaka retired as a customs officer, where he had a responsibility to manage the territorial integrity of our nation. And this has influenced his thought direction to say that when I am elected as president and sworn in on May 29, 2023, I will deploy the use of technology to man our territories particularly our borderlines. And you could say this because it is common knowledge among Nigerians today that those who were responsible for the insecurity situation that we had in our country, 
in the beginning were bandits who crossed our borderlines. And he has said that the borderline, though porous, that the best way to manage the insecurity situation and stop insurgency on the final note is to force begin to man our borderline. And he has the experience to talk about this. You have also spoken to the issue of the uh, 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 um, discomforting disagreement within the People's Democratic Party. And I expected Article to take some measure. Although you didn't list or you didn't mention the measures you expected him to have taken. But it is clear that Atiku Abubakar has been talking to those who are in disagreement with certain individuals within our party. And if that is not peace process, I don't know what other name to call it. On the late Deborah, God bless her soul, you have said it, that Atiku has given his own reason. And you have also said it, that we should find a way of managing the situation in the aftermath of what happened in Kaduna, an advice which I take seriously. And I want to leave these matters as this. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Kola, for joining the conversation this morning on the run-up. It was beautiful speaking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and God bless. All right. It is still the run-up, and we are having conversations around the NSAS anniversary. But we're going to take a quick break. Uh, the news comes up at 12, and after that, we will return, and we will continue having these conversations. Do not go anywhere. Stay with us. <laughs>